Hello and welcome to Altingrad City in City Skylines. Today we enter the next decade in our Central European Eastern Bloc time progression series, the 1980s, mostly known as the last decade of the communist rule. We first must introduce the decade, but that's not going to take us very long. So after that, let's also return and talk about industry and specifically focus on foreign trade. How exactly it worked during the communist times back in the day, how countries traded with the fellow socialist countries, but also with the capitalist West. Meanwhile, in our city, let's move to the outskirts once again and build an electronics factory, a foreign trade company's headquarters, and a computer research center, all in one campus. Let's go. The 1960s and roughly early to mid 1970s are over, and so is the relative economic prosperity. Back in those times, countries heavily invested into all kinds of sectors, from infrastructure to housing, and the consumerist trend took off, while continuing with heavily subsidized prices. Industry continued to be massively expanded to, among other things, provide jobs, any kind of jobs for everyone, which was a success. But the unsustainable nature of this course started to heavily surface from now on. Plus, the global economic situations changed, mainly the energy prices, and more complicated products had to be made, putting pressure on local production or foreign trade. The unsustainability started to manifest itself in increasing debts. Probably the worst case in this time period was Poland, which started to see massive protests again, and the country was not able to pay its debt in 1981 during a martial law. Other countries were not in such a bad state, but not far from it either. In more technical economic terms, our Central European countries, pretty much during the entire communist era, mostly grew extensively meaning they heavily relied on kind of a brute force quantity expansion of industry, but arguably other sectors as well. On the other hand, intensive growth was not prioritized much, meaning improving overall production efficiencies, competitiveness or energy efficiencies. This last point hurt much more now because of the oil shocks previously in the 1970s, which finally hit the socialist countries too. All of this meant that the socialist countries suddenly found themselves in a really difficult spot. The massive industrial capacities built in the 50s or 60s started to show their age, manufacturing was inefficient, consumed a lot of power, and products started to noticeably technologically fall behind the West. Even during the better years, investments into infrastructure were not that high, but now the aging and incomplete infrastructure worsened the production efficiencies even more. At the top of all this were the authoritarian regimes with their total rigid inefficient control of everything and actually on the top top was the Soviet leadership still. Central European countries already saw a few times the brotherly help by Soviet armies when some countries strayed too far from the accepted political or economic line. Party membership was of course strictly needed for various important management positions still, so those were not always done by the most competent people available. This combined with the fact that most things belonged to the state in the centrally planned economies meant that it was solely the state's responsibility for, well, everything. So all blame for any one thing going wrong in the country was immediately put on the state. So not exactly a great thing for political stability. This was actually really nicely said in 1989 by the Czechoslovak Secretary General of the Communist Party during an hour-long speech that basically became a meme afterwards used to discredit the regime. Although if you listen to the whole thing, it's actually an invaluable historical source from the perspective of the communists. It showed how they were very much accurately aware of what's going on and even how to fix a lot of things but it's unlikely they even wanted to at this point or were able to. Nevertheless, in 1989, it was too little too late. Anyways, among many other things, he also mentioned the big economic problems of Poland and partially Hungary, how, in his words, they borrowed a lot of expensive Western money to spend on consumer goods. But I want to mostly focus on his notes about political stability. He, for example, said very bluntly, quote, 
Well working economy means that the party will be backed by workers, farmers and majority of intelligentsia. End quote. And another one, quote, there is no bread. What is the government doing? What is the party doing? How are they managing things when there is no bread? Would anyone ask that question in capitalism? Of course not. No one would think to connect the government and baker not baking bread. End quote. This just nicely illustrates how the communists put themselves in a corner eventually. And now, when the consequences of their tight management became clearer, it basically put countries and communist parties on a downward spiral trajectory. Governments trying to maintain stability cut down investments, further slowing the intensive growth, so improving efficiencies, technologies, or cutting down energy costs. This led to even worse profits from foreign trade as products kept falling behind, populations started to notice that things are not going so well, prices of some things kept going up, new things were not built as much, maintenance was lacking, environment was getting worse, so overall morale of the population declined, production efficiencies dropped more, therefore the entire economy, and so on and so on, further down the spiral. An important potential change appeared when the new Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev took office in 1985 and in 1986 started the perestroika, meaning rework or reconstruction. But perhaps more important was the Soviet's decision to no longer keep the Central European countries on a leash. This suddenly opened way for the countries to start their own economic reforms, loosen various tight policies and even broaden cooperation with the West in some economic aspects. Certain companies did start cooperating with Western companies more, some private businesses were suddenly allowed, although very carefully, censorship somewhat lifted, although in some countries most changes were rather cosmetic. And overall the communist regimes did not want to change much, despite big talks of major reforms. But uh, the regimes had to be careful this time, because they would not be backed by the Soviets anymore. The populations were not particularly happy with things, still. This is actually very nicely documented, once again, by various television programs or interviews from the time, thanks to the loosened censorship. I found one documentary from Czechoslovak television from a factory, where they were asking workers what they think about the upcoming reconstruction. On one hand, people clearly wanted change, not even some drastic change, it seems, but some pragmatic economic reform, among many, many other things. However, they had zero confidence in the ruling regimes to provide it, since exactly the same people, exactly the same regime, heavily pushed the previous economic system and ideology, and now, suddenly, because someone said something in the Soviet Union, we are allowed to do a complete 180 turn, people just did not buy it. And they were right. So, in 1989, the communist rule ended in Central Europe. But we will focus on that in more detail some other time. That was a brief background for the 1980s. So, economic problems and eventual fall of communism. The effects on cities were noticeable and we will go through them in separate episodes. But just to mention a few, more visible decay of public spaces because of all the places from the 50s, 60s started to age only partial and slow continuation of infrastructure projects with some few starts of new ones. New housing projects, however, kept popping up and still very significant numbers of new flats were built. Not as many as in the 70s, far from it actually, but a lot still. However, with increasing problems regarding the finishing works and providing amenities. Demolitions of old city blocks were still happening from time to time and new buildings took their place. Architecture and urbanism started to slowly move away from some modernist ideas in favor of postmodernism. It is a somewhat logical yet still peculiar characteristic of an authoritarian centrally planned economy that even if there are big economic problems and people waiting in lines for some groceries, for example, there still can be huge new projects, since it could have had some political significance or it was already part of some existing long-term plans. That was the case of, for example, some nuclear power plants or dams, tunnels, government buildings, those kinds of structures, some of which we will build in the city later. Anyways, let's now finally talk about foreign trade. 
The communist Central European countries traded with pretty much the entire world, although there was a huge difference between getting products to and from the Comic-Con countries and all the others. Comic-Con will be very important here. It is short for the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance. I already talked about it. It was an organization for basically trading between the socialist countries and integration of economies under control of the Soviet Union, which was able to heavily influence the heading of economies of Comic-Con's members. So Comic-Con countries practically means the entire communist Europe, plus Vietnam, Cuba and Mongolia. Comic-Con established its own international bank to facilitate the foreign trade and a special currency was created for international trading, the transferable ruble. It was actually not a currency at all, just a virtual tool. Countries could not change it for foreign socialist currencies and could not even buy anything for it abroad. It was only possible to use it as compensation after signing a trade agreement between two countries under the umbrella of the Comic-Con. Transferable ruble was otherwise worthless outside of Comic-Con. Significant number of these foreign trades were heavily political and determined at the Comic-Con councils through yet another plans. Some of those were heavily unfavorable for the exporting party, since they would not be even paid or were compensated really weirdly, like for example exporting locomotives and receiving equal weight in tomatoes. Compensation was overall difficult to calculate due to the differences in countries' economies and very difficult determining of values of foreign products. Since they were made under different central plans with different goals, state influences and so on. That is probably the reason why exchange of socialist currencies was on one hand possible, but it was not that simple. The whole thing about trading only through bilateral agreements, through governments, various councils, ministries, it just made the whole process very rigid and very lengthy. The various Comic-Con plans also had very strong ideological background, so helping out fellow countries with various shortages, sharing technologies and so on, all in the collective spirit. A noble intention, but at the end of the day, things are not manufactured for free. Further, deeper economic integration was wanted by the Soviet Union to eventually establish one big economic system through Comic-Con, so trading would be much easier, but countries eventually rejected the idea, likely fearing too much Soviet control. All of these things combined made countries economically isolated to some level, although it's a question of what was first, chicken or the egg, economic isolation or difficult foreign trade. That is why people often, in Czechia at least, but other socialist countries I assume, remember the good old days when we were manufacturing pretty much everything. Because socialist countries truly were manufacturing most little things for themselves. Even though the reality of actual supply was quite wild. But again, was this situation wanted or it had to be like that since there was no easier way? Despite countries making a lot of products domestically, they couldn't make everything, or couldn't make something in sufficient quantities or qualities. And then there are natural resources that are simply not everywhere in every single country, especially uh, things like oil or gas. So foreign trade was crucial regardless, and it would have only been beneficial if it could happen easily. Local production is of course quite manageable if products are simple or don't require many inputs, but as technologies go forward, there need to be many new things made, not to mention the things to make things, so parts of machines, electronics or special materials. And that is where the Comic-Con countries started to significantly struggle. Even despite certain local technological advances in various sectors, for example in the computer sector, it was a problem to source specialized parts throughout the whole Comic-Con. The reasons were so, so many. But once again related to pretty much all the things already mentioned previously on the domestic levels. So rigid central planning, rigid export and import plans, bureaucracy, monopolies, local but also international because of Comic-Con's national specializations, so some products were only made in some countries. 
Then there is, for example, the reluctance to push for certain advances in various technologies, and for example, the forced, more Eastern orientation of foreign trade towards more developing markets, so even less motivation to make advanced things. So this leads me to foreign trade with the West. It simply had to happen. Certain specialized products were only available in the West and were key in production of even some older products in the Eastern Bloc. Although, for example, even some basic agricultural materials were bought in the West too. But trading with the West was a problem, since there was this little thing called the Cold War going on. There were various export embargoes that clearly hurt the East more than the West, and overall West was obviously reluctant to see the Eastern Bloc do well and vice versa. Direct exchange of currencies was not possible, the Western banking system did not want to touch the Eastern currencies due to the state's manipulations and difficult determining of market rates, plus politics, of course. But the East did not want direct exchange either, as it feared too close ties with the Western economies, so lowering the Soviet influence over Central Europe. If an Eastern Bloc's country needed a Western product, it needed that Western currency, or the so-called hard currency. The only way to get it was to sell something in the West. So a factory would produce something for local currency, state would sell it abroad for maybe US dollars, but those dollars would not make its way back to the factory. The state would keep them and pay the factory in local currency as it saw fit. Some sources cynically describe this relationship as state cashing in juicy Western money while handing out monopoly papers to its people who made the thing. The same people would mostly not be even able to go to that country where the product went and their monopoly money was close to worthless there anyway. But even at the state level, more often than not, the export was done with a loss after determining the worth of that hard currency for the local economy. Why? Well, because in the 1980s, pretty much the only competitive advantage left of Eastern export was low price. But this is the funny thing. The products were not actually cheap to make. Remember what I mentioned earlier about the manufacturing, the efficiencies and all of that? How did the companies not go bankrupt? Well, because they couldn't. They were owned and guaranteed by the state, which fully controlled the local currency without worrying about its worth on the international market. So in a way, the state might have been able to do whatever it wanted on the outside while doing something else towards the inside. But the imbalance would show eventually, since countries were able to import less and less. This is actually once again really nicely illustrated in various media from mid to late 1980s where people openly spoke about the practice, mostly just stating the sad obvious. There is one Czechoslovak television news report in particular, where the reporter is in a factory making precision machining tools for Canada. And he's saying, quote, because they are exported with profit, not loss, unlike majority of our engineering products into the advanced capitalist countries, it is clear that they are not yet obsolete, end quote. This sentence alone just says everything. That astonishment that it's possible to export with a profit these days and that there are still products that are not yet obsolete. This was not always the case. Some Eastern Bloc's products were quite advanced and were largely competitive in the West before, but not anymore, with few exceptions like that machining tool. The whole exporting situation and need to get the hard currency also created a strange double quality reality. Just lowering prices for the Western export would not work forever and it could not work for some products at all. Therefore, products made for the Western markets had high quality or even better features. Even the communist export managers quickly learned how to compete on free markets. On the other hand, the socialist markets required no such thing as selling products to the domestic market was basically guaranteed, no matter the condition of the product, and the Comic-Con exports imports were politically backed, so same thing. This also meant that trading inside Comic-Con was not particularly favorable, as countries primarily wanted to sell their production in the West for that hard currency. The nature of plant production and this logical double quality also sometimes created eyebrow-raising situations when products were made for that juicy Western export while local shops had empty shelves. 
Once again, all of this is already perfectly documented by various media from mid to late 1980s. And lastly, one other important link in foreign trade – the export companies. Those are not exactly common today, as various companies deal with selling products on their own, but the nationalized and centrally controlled production worked differently. Export companies were basically middlemen. Their job was the same as a sales department, which was missing in the companies back then, especially for the foreign trade. They were tasked with promoting the products abroad, they would then take the product off the manufacturer and deliver it abroad. There were many export companies, usually divided by specializations. Export companies were also quite prestigious. This is clearly illustrated by simply looking at their headquarters, buildings that are very fancy for the time. Work in an export company was very much wanted, because people there had good contact with the outside world, dealers were allowed to travel around the planet, and some were able to maybe smuggle a little something back home, including the hard currency itself. These people were then very well experienced with trading and free markets, which would give them an enormous head start in the 1990s to do local business. Not always legal. So that was just a little introduction to these topics, once again barely scratching the surface, but I think it's enough basic context for the 1980s. I'm not going to talk about the 90s here or the current times, I'm not going to compare the current times, we are going to have plenty of opportunity to do that when we reach those uh, next decades. And we are also going to focus more on some little subtopics, especially related to just city development. But now for today's build, which is the headquarters of an export company, probably related to electronics, because the rest of the area is an electronics or computer factory and research center. The loose inspirations came mostly from two places. The first is in Dresden, the former Robotron headquarters from early 1970s, which I used mostly for the research area. And then there is the headquarters and factory of the Research Institute of Mathematic Machines in Prague also from early 1970s. From here I mostly wanted to replicate that strange position of the tower, since it's between a low density district and a natural reserve, so one would really not expect a high rise in here, yet there it is. Sure, these were both a little older, I know computers were already made in the 50s, but I just needed an excuse to start the 80s with some industry, so why not do this now? Anyways, let's talk about more details of today's build. At first I wanted to build just a generic industrial zone in here, just as a background for what I was talking about, but uh, then I downloaded that high-rise building. I downloaded it for Asturis initially, or at least I saw it in the workshop for Asturis, but uh, I also had it, uh, just by accident really, enabled for the Altengrad playset, or you know, the Skype set of assets, so uh, I decided to just try it, because I was kind of searching for some sort of office buildings, and this one seemed to be really fitting for this time period, and uh, like footprint-wise, height-wise, it was just very much fitting this entire area and project, so here it is. That was the first key element in this entire build. The second key element was of course the tram loop. We had the tram tracks going into this direction, if it's going to be some kind of industrial zone then it must have some kind of uh, public transport going to it. The tram tracks were crossing or are crossing that uh, railway, which is the urban railway, that's uh, the new one that uh, eventually connects the two city parts together, and uh, it has a very important station in here, so it's also serving the industrial zone, but as a transfer to the trams as well, and some of the neighboring residential places. So that's actually going to be quite a busy place, that entire hub there. Now this tram loop was not exactly positioned all that ideally, because uh, at first I wanted to have like a, another tram station, tram stop further or closer to the industrial area, but uh, that would just be way too close to the existing uh, stop at the train station, so I decided to just slightly move the tram stop from the train station, so it's still like a single station entirely, or a single hub, but uh, people can just... Uh, have like much uh, much more convenient uh, access from trams into 
the industry. I also shifted the main pedestrian entrance of the factory closer to the train station and I just decorated that with uh, some, some kind of communist banners and just like a gibberish slogan of some sorts at, uh, at the main gate. So uh, obviously the main center point is that uh, big high rise there. That's going to be the headquarters of that export company. Just like uh, just like I showed you that picture or that uh, shot from Prague where there is that tower right next to the natural reserve. So that's that's very similar to this place. Even though the tower that I placed over here is like uh, like double the height. Yeah, it, it's very very tall. But uh, still, it's quite fitting. The factory as well is much larger footprint, so that kind of balances that. So you know that's nice. Uh, right next to this pond, I also added that. Uh, like a, like a building, fancy looking building, like a entrance to the, to the pond area. So yeah, that was, uh, that was that. And, uh, at first I was thinking I'm going to extend the residential places, but, uh, I didn't, I don't really need to. I also want to, at this point, uh, I want to try to keep some places open because I might do some projects there in the 1990s. So, uh, you know, I just don't want to fill absolutely everything right now. Also, I added that uh, 1980 uh, flower bed uh, thing detail there. That's actually very easy to do these days. I used exactly the same technique as in the city center when I did something similar with that pattern. So it's a pedestrian path, but it's uh, changed with the uh, intersection marking tools because you can also use trees there as the decorative lines. So, you know, I just use flowers like that with random orientation so it doesn't look uh, that uh, artificial. I mean, it looks heavily artificial still, but it's like a nice detail. And uh, I just wanted to put some sort of a detail in here that's going to uh, like very clearly tell you that we have entered that uh, new decade. Uh, it's inside the tram loop. Uh, there are just some trams uh, sitting there. By the way, I got rid of finally the old trams, the very old trams that we have had from the 1930s because uh, in Prague as well, they were already retired in 74 or 76, if I'm not mistaken, some, some, some kind of year like that. So in the 1980s, they would not have been seen on these lines at all. And I also got rid of the steam trains. In Czechoslovakia, they got uh, the last steam train, regular steam train, uh, was in 1980. I believe in Poland it was a little longer than that because they were just running between the coal mines and all of that. But uh, still, you know, in this time period they would be quite rare anyway. So yeah, that was this uh, this project on the side of this new residential district. It definitely needed something different than just residential buildings. So here it is, here's the factory, you know, it just added some kind of jobs, which the city definitely needed gameplay wise. As you can tell, there are a lot of pedestrians using this place, so that's very nice. And together with that depot that's right in front of us in this view, it's just adding some variety to this uh, residential district even though I still do have plans to extend that residential district quite a lot. You can tell by all those uh, like uh, like uh, decals, mud and sand decals around that are obviously uh, symbolizing that there will be some more construction happening in here. Anyway, guys, that's going to be all for today's Altengrad episode. In the next one, we are going to take a look at the racing circuit, finally. All right, I'm going to be talking about the motorsport there and those kinds of related things. So thank you for watching this one. If you liked it, then please do all the necessary things below the video, all the clicking, writing, subscribing, sharing, and big thanks to the channel members who are directly supporting this channel and what I do here. So hugely appreciate that, guys. Thank you again and goodbye.